Hello, everybody. We are in a public session of uh, one of our study groups at Cycloge. And here we are a few friends who are going to look into tools of uh, data visualization and literate programming. We'll begin the meeting with uh, like not a long uh, uh, technical overview and practical introduction. And later we will have a discussion. And this meeting is directed mainly at the SICM Utils study group that has just begun, uh, which is uh, like a new project uh, I'm fascinated by. And uh, so some of our examples will be related to this SICM Utils project, which is about bringing classical mechanics and uh, uh, symbolic math to uh, closure. And um, yeah, so so um, let us maybe uh, share for a moment uh, our plan. Um, I'll share my screen for a moment. Yeah, uh, probably you see my editor, right? Yeah. So that is uh, the plan. Uh, we were just discussing what this meeting is about, and we will maybe say a few words about what we want from the in these fields of little programming and data visualization and then have some example uh, see the bigger landscape and then go into some practical things and then discuss um, great so so this uh, notion literate programming that uh, i think was phrased by donald knot uh, is uh, has been getting different interpretations uh, along the years. Uh, but but uh, for us, the idea is mainly to be able to tell the story of our code in a certain document that contains both textual story and code, and also some outputs of the code, which could be either textual or visual in some way. And this is a need that we have in many of our uh, in many of the things we are doing, like when we document something, when we're trying to write a tutorial, when we are creating a certain report of some data analysis. In all these cases, we need this mix of text and code and output. And um, we've been using this practice, I think, in building a few of the new libraries for data science enclosure as a way of documenting our libraries and also documenting them in a way that is uh, testable, that creates a document that is, is a test for what the library is about. Um, and uh, we'll begin by uh, a small example, um, which is, uh, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll share my screen again. Uh, it is an example we've built for, for this uh, SICM util study group. And uh, this uh, GitHub, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Mm, yeah, so um, yeah, so we created this uh, GitHub repo uh, as a combination of the node space tool we will be seeing and the SICM utils library so that people can start working on documenting the physical experiments and physical simulations. So for example, uh, we have created uh, this uh, um, report about the famous double pendulum problem in physics, where you know you want to to see a, a pendulum that is hanging on another pendulum, and you want to see them moving by the phys the rules of mechanics. And typically, you want to see that a long time, but also see a few other uh, mechanical variables, uh, so that. You can see a full view of what is happening. And uh, creating this and uh, 
creating it in a way that uh, shows the data and, and the, the, the formulas uh, and all, all the details uh, is something that we will be doing a lot uh, uh, in our studies. And uh, here we created it with node space. What we don't see at the moment is the process of creation. And uh, what we hope to do is to allow creating such documents, such visual documents, uh, without leaving our usual environment of, of our REPL and editor that most closure pr practitioners like. And so that will be the goal uh, to see how we can do that in a certain session, which is a typical closure session, uh, without changing too, too much of the usual habits. Um, and yeah, maybe, uh, yeah. Um, uh, any questions about that so far? No, great. Right. So um, well, we will uh, now uh, look into the practices of, of writing such a document. And uh, what I'll share is uh, the code of, uh, uh, of uh, this very same uh, repository. Um, Well, uh, well, we'll just have like a small uh, um, demo namespace. So you see what we have here is a closure namespace. Well, we are requiring some libraries and defining something. So nothing is too special except for these metadata that we will discuss in a moment. And uh, typically we may add some text also, uh, something like that. Right. Uh, we, we will add some markdown text that we want to be rendered as part of the story that we are rendering. And in the, in the node space tool, what we typically do is after we initialize the system, uh, we, we can create uh, some uh, web view. So we will typically work alongside our editor. We will have the browser uh, with a view that will see the, the emerging document that we are creating. And um, we, we um, uh, what I'm showing is doable in all, all the, the uh, famous closure editors and repls, but uh, um, here I'm using Emacs and I have some key bindings that will allow this flow to, to uh, be kind of fluent. And if anybody wants to uh, make that happen in another editor, then we have started that work. And so let us talk about it. I think I'll stop sharing my screen because I have some rendering problem. Uh, I'm sharing again, right? So we have our editor and the, um, uh, the browser alongside it. And now what I, I'll do is to actually evaluate the whole namespace but by some key binding, but I'm evaluating it in a way that that is uh, updating the view in a sense. So what we're getting is this view uh, on the browser. Uh, can you see my browser well? Yeah. Um, and you see uh, when we had this text, it was rendered as markdown. When we are defining some things, we see the code when we are actually printing something, then it is being uh, viewed by the kind that we are specifying using this metadata. So the data set kind means that we will have this view of a data set as a table. And uh, we are using here the table cloth library for working with data sets, which is really a, a, a beautiful story in itself. Yeah, you should look into it, I, I think. And, um, um, and then when we want some visualization, then we will say we want something of the Vega kind, which is this uh, uh, for data format for specifying plots. And, and uh, but if we do not uh, specify any kind of, of what we are creating, 
but just writing some code that returns some value, then we'll just uh, see the value printed, right? Um, that, does it make sense so far? Yeah. And so what you have seen is that we have text and code and outputs, and we can have them rendered in a certain dynamic way where by some key bindings of the editor, we are invoking certain evaluations. And these evaluations affect the emerging view, uh, which is our document. And um, we can also do it uh, dynamically by changing only one note, so to speak, and or not only not just the whole namespace. So for example, I can change the data here and evaluate this one by some key binding. And, it updates without needing to update uh, everything. Um, great. So uh, that, is, that is it in a sense. Um, we are building it in an extensible way so that you can add more kinds of, of notes uh, and specify how they should be rendered. And uh, we are also um, doing some dispatch on the type for so that we can infer the proper way of rendering something by the type of the return value. So for example, um, when we are rendering, rendering uh, uh, some uh, uh, mathematical formula, we can render it uh, by uh, using the uh, tech format. Uh, well, we don't have it here, uh, Never mind. Um, uh, so that, that is it, but maybe I'll add some one more aspect of it, and that is that sometimes one may like to create uh, um, a big namespace enclosure where you're actually computing some things that may take time. And then we would like to keep the workflow of creating the document as lightweight as possible without having to wait a lot. We want a dynamic experience like we always do in Clojure. We want to have it like playful. And um, that is why in Node Space, we adopted some of the time semantics of Clojure for certain kinds of time constructs. You know, in Clojure, you have futures and delays and atoms, all kinds of, of entities where there is a certain semantic about how uh, the value of the entity behaves in time. And for example, uh, when we have a future, this means that we may wait some time and the value will be ready only in the future. So let us create something like that. Um, we will make it sleep for a few seconds and then compute something, right? And um, uh, when we, uh, oh, I'm not in the right tab. When we render the, the node space now, you see, we will see that this future is still running. So we don't have the value yet, but when it is ready, it should be there. And now it is ready and we, it, it tells us that it de de referenced the future. That is how they call it in Clojure. The reference that is it asked for the value. So the value now is the value that is uh, the dereferenced value of the future. Um, and another common uh, uh, time construct enclosure is a delay. A delay is something that um, will not be computed unless you actually ask for the value. So for example, even before rendering, let us play with the REPL for a moment so we can define some uh, X to be a delay of some computation. And then uh, this computation hasn't happened yet. Let us prove it, right? Uh, let us uh, see the record where we can see some print results. So X will be a delay where we actually print something. So now we evaluate it this expression, X is already defined. We can ask, what is the type of X? It is a delay, right? But it never printed that it was working. So it hasn't happened yet. And 
uh, when we actually ask in the REPL for the dereference value of x, then it was actually working. Oh, and it actually printed. Uh, you can see it maybe. And, um, and that is how delays works. And they turn out to be quite comfortable for writing a big namespace with a lot of computations where we, not, we do not want all of them to actually happen when we evaluate the namespace, but only uh, when we actually want to see them. So typically in node space, we may write something like that, a delay of something. And then when we evaluate the namespace, then this delay says it is not running yet. And we can, by some key binding, uh, evaluate this note and ask to, to realize it. And then it is the reference and it is fine and it is working. Um, does it make sense? Yeah. Um, great. So, hey, so hey, Daniel. Hey, yeah. Daniel, quick question. For the future one, I'm, I'm trying to see if you, instead of future, if you just use a do, do block, right? And then have, yeah, so do thread dot sleep and then this. Will yeah. it not have the same effect? Uh, yeah, so it will, but uh, uh, it will, um, happen on the same thread of the evaluation. Thank you for this comment. It is actually important. So a future runs on a separate thread. Okay. So you can keep going with the, your work. And when it is ready, it will update the view. But uh, you shouldn't bother about waiting. You can keep evaluating other things if it makes sense. Okay. I see. OK. So. So, for example, here in the REPL, I can define f to be a future of uh, 1 plus 2. And it hasn't... Okay, so now, actually, it is not a good example because it was immediate. So let us have it uh, uh, sleep for 20 seconds, maybe. So it is not there yet, but I can keep going with the REPL. And now, if I try to dereference it, then I have to wait if it's not... Oh. It was actually sleeping for 20 milliseconds, so let us have it longer. Oh, sorry, much longer. Now it is not there yet, and when I ask it, then I need to wait till it is ready. And we would oh, like to wait too much. Yeah, so thank you for this comment. It was actually uh, important. Mm, great. I see. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so that, that was a, a short intro to... to uh, node space in general. And now maybe we will look for a moment at the specific uh, um, namespace where we saw the, the double pendulum example. There are actually two of these. The exercise 144 is more full. It is bigger and actually it is something that Sam Ritchie wrote uh, in the last few days. Really magnificent, but we will just look into the smaller one. And Daniel? Yeah. Before you get going, I have a question about, um, is there any thought about reactive programming? So let's say that I have a data frame and then I have a visualization that depends on the data frame. If the values in my data frame change, does the visualization get updated automatically? Wonderful, yeah, thank you, So Yeah, that is so, so like uh, one of the things that we're really wondering about. So. Conceptually, you see node space tries to, to be responsive to changes in the values that are attached to certain entities, such as futures, delays, and also atoms. We haven't looked into atoms, but atoms would be OK, too. And it is still a bit buggy. Actually, uh, we may even run into this today. There are some concurrency bugs in node space that I hope to fix. But conceptually, it should be just fine and it should be already uh, happy to deal with entities with changing values. And then we could imagine to have a separate library that takes care of certain time semantics and certain de dependencies between 
uh, some st stateful entities. And then node space will just be happy to render it when it changes. That is at least the vision and we are not so far from it. And I think conceptually we can think about it as two separate problems. Yep, and got it. Writing a, a reactive uh, um, a functional reactive programming enclosure in the JVM could be fun. A little bit different from the things we are seeing typically in closure scripts because closure is multi-threaded. So there are a few more problems to think about when we want to do it right. But I will be happy to think about it together and maybe write something that that will fit our needs. Um, great. So uh, any other thoughts for now? Yeah, so um, what we, we are looking into now is this namespace of the double pendulum problem. And you see, I put in the comment the calls to the main API functions. Uh, so there is this, this one for initializing and this one for initializing and just opening a browser tab where we can see the view. And this one is for evaluating the whole node space, the whole namespace. And this one is for taking the view we see in the browser and just saving it as a static HTML that is standalone and can be shared in uh, GitHub pages, like actually the one we were seeing here, which is an HTML file that does not depend on a running uh, backend. And uh, some other API calls are not here and they are for uh, realizing delays and for interacting with a note in a certain line, for example. Typically, you would like to have some key bindings in your editor uh, to use these. And uh, if anybody wants, then, then I will be happy to meet and, and play with that together. But uh, for now, let us look into these as the main uh, API uh, uh, functions. And uh, that's it. And in this, uh, um, uh, yeah, let us render it for a moment. So in this uh, uh, notebook, you see we have some text and and we, we have some um, things where we spef specify the kind, but nothing more than that. The, the one interesting thing that we haven't discussed yet is Hanami, which is the other topic of this meeting. But except for that, it is all, it is all uh, usual. Uh, this formula that we see uh, is uh, rendered using the Katech uh, JavaScript library that knows how to render tech. And the reason that it is rendered by this way is that the type of this closure value is one of the special types of the SICM utils library that are actually assigned this behavior of automatically being rendered as tech. And yeah, and so it is a, like a nice example of extensibility of actually handling special types in a certain way. And let us think if we need more of that. Um, yeah, so, so I think that's it for like a short uh, practical introduction to node space. And I think, um, uh, yeah, let us see if there are any comments or thoughts about this. Uh, I had a question about sort of practical use. Um, so after you've done your notebook style exploration and you've got your visualizations kind of the way you like them, uh, at some point you probably want to um, make this available to people uh, without the note, note space in infrastructure around it. So there is the static page. Uh, so a couple of questions. One, does that um, still allow you to have interactive controls within the page, like a slider that would control a variable. And the other question would be just in, in general, um, what is the process for going from your notebook to a uh, standalone uh, page with interactive visualizations? Is, is there a straightforward um, process to do that? Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, I'm happy to discuss that uh, actually. Yeah, so so 
eventually we want to automate that and make it really transparent. But at the moment, what we have to do is to create this HTML file and serve it somehow. We typically use uh, GitHub pages. So that means that we just need to push it and to mark that uh, certain branch in the certain GitHub repo so that it knows that it is part of the GitHub pages. So that actually when we type the path that corresponds to the file, then we actually see it. And everything we just said should be automated because it is quite of a hassle to actually create that URL and paste it in the readme and all that. It should be done better and probably we will just need to do it in a few days. Um, and yeah, about that HTML. So um, it is uh, indeed standalone in the sense of not needing a backend. And that means that all computations that took place on the JVM are done already. But as far as it, uh, as far as we are interested in the JavaScript closure script interaction, then it is still there. And that is because this HTML does load all the bundle of dependencies, including Vega and Vega Lite. So what we just saw with the uh, animation, oh, I stopped sharing, never mind. But uh, the animation that we just saw was in an HTML file of this kind that actually loads the dependencies uh, of the client side. Uh, does it make oh. sense? Yeah. yeah, no, that sounds great. And so is there, in that page, is there a slider or something that, that lets you control I'm, a variable that... I'm not sure if it's on um, like the Hanami example, but Sam does have um, like one of his double pendulum examples or like state dynamical examples where you've got like a little slider and you can sort of uh, kick the values around. So it definitely is a capability. Great. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, and so uh, here, this no, there it uh, is. slider <laughs> is part of the uh, Vega Lite functionality. And uh, maybe that will be the topic of uh, the other part of this meeting, just mm -hmm. figuring out how we work with Hanami and Vega Lite to get this uh, interaction. Uh, so that is one kind of interaction, but we could also hope to have uh, closure script, uh, React-based interaction where we can add our own UI elements. And there we still need to think and make the story a bit better than it is at the moment. And uh, yeah, and, and uh, actually that, that is, it could be a nice topic for the discussion later. Um, any other uh, thoughts? Um, great, thank you. So. Now, uh, what I thought is we could look into the um, the the, uh, the the bigger landscape where we are at, and uh, into a few of the of the tools um, that do exist in this field of literate programming and data visualizations in Clojure. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, I'm sharing the screen again. Um, so I tried to make a list. Probably I'm missing a few. Um, but I think it, it is important to, to know about these and to try to think how, how eventually what we can hope of all these to, to become. So I guess we'll spend a few minutes by, by talking about this. And I think a few of you have more comments than I'll say. So please comment more about them. Uh, so one flavor of literate programming uh, that does support closure is writing a certain text file, which is not a typical closure namespace, but actually text. And inside it, putting some code blocks and using some way to render that text with code with output. And I guess the two famous ways are, or the two famous for they, uh, text formats are org mode and markdown. This file is an org mode file, which is specific to Emacs. And it does allow all of that, uh, like creating visual outputs, rendering into different data formats, having a dynamic experience uh, of 
of editing and visualizing. And I think the main reason we are not using it is that it is very much uh, attached to the Emacs editor and we, we seek some, some platform that will be editor agnostic so that all closure people will be able to enjoy it. But really, Ogmod is magnificent. And I think a few of you could say more about it if you wish. Uh, probably Daniel, Daniel has more to say about Ogmod. Ogmod. And um, so please stop me whenever it makes sense. Uh, another one is, um, uh, oh, Daniel is going to say something. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, no, so just uh, I am an Ogmod user, um, and um, Danielle used the term uh, magnificent, so I concur. <laughs> and uh, I, I would be happy to uh, answer any question you, you would have uh, about Ogmod, um, because it's an important piece of... Um, of tech uh, used in many contexts um, and for a, a tremendous uh, amount of applications. Uh, it is extremely generic. It, it is not something that has been devised specifically for data science, but it can be uh, used uh, in, in, in a very uh, broad range of fields and um, I've seen examples of uh, literate programming, which are really mind blowing in org mode. Um, and uh, it's very elegant. Um, I'm a big fan. Uh, I'm, I'm actually a, a big, I mean, I, I'm, I, uh, I'm not a data scientist, so I'm not uh, um, so, so uh, invested in the topics of notebooks. Uh, which which uh, there's something about notes which I don't like uh, instinctively, intuitively, um, but um, uh, I, I would be happy to answer any any question you would have on Ogmod. But Ogmod would be my 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 go-to um, tool if I wanted to to do a presentation uh, and show code and visualizations uh, because it's uh, extremely powerful in that re that regard. And it, it's a big ecosystem, uh, so it, it, you can uh, leverage, um, first of all, for example, uh, Org Babel, which literally um, is a universal um, slot for any code, any, any programming language uh, supported by, um, by Org Babel, which, but the list is, is Really, really exhaustive. Like you can, you can, you can embed um, a, a huge amount of different programming languages in the same document, and it uh, it's uh, it doesn't it doesn't mind if if one one code block is closure and the next code block is Go and the next one is Haskell and the next one is Bash and the next one is whatever. You, it's extremely flexible. Um, and, it, and there is a huge ecosystem, as I said, so you can uh, you can leverage that uh, to to uh, to make uh, anything you want, basically. Um, but uh, this is uh, this is um, not not a topic of of today, so I don't want to 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 be too too invading that in that regard. But just I would be happy to to uh, to address uh, any anything related to Omo. That's it. Thank you. I just I just wanted to say that uh, for some of us sort of wanting to get into Emacs more, um, I think it would be helpful, um, like perhaps if we could uh, maybe have a discussion one day about like sort of all the sort of a brief overview of like the possibilities and and like how to use uh, Emacs and org org mode uh, to like the fullest extent. I would yeah, love that maybe. discussion too, because uh, I, as Daniel know, I mean, I've tried Emacs on and off a couple of times, uh, but in the last two months or so, I've again picked it up and I, uh, I've really enjoyed using it now and primarily using org mode 
and uh, recently uh, turned on org roam so it's uh, really it feels really nice to do that and uh, tried some org presentations using uh, uh, epresent and uh, reveal so it looks pretty pretty nice uh, uh, so yeah it, i'd love to have that conversation with some of the you know uh, some of the veterans so, uh, in org mode i think i think the big the big lesson of um of org mode is that you um, it is um, it, it, it is part of the the list image in which uh, MX uh, um, runs right so MX is nothing else than a list runtime and and the power of of a, of a, a list runtime a dynamic runtime with the REPL is that you you can do anything anything you want and that is the this is what mx is right like mx and all its ecosystem is it's all it's all this code which runs in a runtime and org mode is one um invocation of that right it's just one one um instantiation of of functionality in list so uh, the the idea here is that a runtime is is the secret the runtime the runtime everything happens in the same runtime so um the problem with notebooks is that it is detached from the runtime so at development at development time it is it is attached via all kinds of protocols and 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 um connections socket or otherwise but uh, then the presentation it is detached from the runtime the user who watches it doesn't have the runtime available. That's and and that that is a limitation of notebooks. Um, so the 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 idea of a runtime uh, which can be shared is actually is something that exists in the small talk world. So small talk, this is exactly what they do. They have images which you load in the runtime, and the user can have exactly you can share the image that the developer is has has been using, and then the user can load it up. And has the same uh, dynamic. He, he has exactly the same thing that the developer had in his hands, which is what you want, actually. Where, um, and testament to that is the question before when somebody said, "Okay, um, uh, do, do you have a dynamic um, uh, interaction with the presentation of your notebook to the user?" And in that case. Uh, Daniel showed uh, a slider, uh, but that that is uh, because it is it is only valid for the data range for for this particular type of of visualization, uh, the concrete example that that you're putting there. But with the runtime, you don't you don't need that. You have access to everything, to the whole language, to the whole runtime, and um, this is why I think small talk is the ultimate. Uh, Target for these for 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 data science uh, and and somebody, I mean, in the landscape, I saw one thing missing, and that is the small talk um, uh, project that is being developed now, um, and which is Daniel. Maybe you can remind me the name because we we've, we've been talking about this lately. Yeah, I, I, I did mention a glamorous toolkit because yeah, uh, yeah closure yeah. environment, and we're at this talk we're focusing on closure environments. But uh, yes, yeah. certainly there are other things to look out for uh, in the uh, bigger picture. Yeah. Yeah. Faro, so, Faro so, and uh, Glam GTK, Glamorous Toolkit, is, uh, is really phenomenal. And uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, did we have a talk on that, Daniel, here? Um, no. So I, I, I'm the troublemaker who says uh, maybe maybe we shouldn't do closure, we should do small talk, basically. Yeah. So uh, Daniel, uh, um, thank you for that. Uh, um, I maybe the, the last part is maybe beyond the scope of what we could contain today, but it would be <laughs> lovely to talk about it more. Um, so let us uh, come back to the landscape of closure tooling. Um, 
So I, I will share my screen again and, and please stop me again uh, with any of these uh, if you have more comments. Um, so another, another way which is kind of similar to um, Augmod in the, as a tool for literate programming in Clojure is R Markdown Clojure. What R Markdown is, is something which is part of the R ecosystem. It is a way for creating beautiful documents in really various formats like PDF and HTML and others. And um, with also with a great experience, which is a dynamic experience of, of document creation. And uh, our friend uh, Tomas uh, created uh, a bridge for closure, so you can create beautiful closure documentation uh, using uh, R Markdown. And actually, if you look into the documentation of tablecloth, then it is written uh, this way, for example. Um, now we'll move to uh, maybe a different flavor of tools. Uh, all these uh, reveal portal, OS, literate note space. I think they are all. Uh, certainly not a comprehensive list. They are, they are all trying to have some web view alongside the REPL, except for Reveal, which is not a web page, but actually uh, a Java uh, user interface uh, based on Java FX and uh, Clojure FX. And um, uh, all of these are kind of trying to allow this view of the data that you can very much dynamically push for uh, and uh, during your typical work in, in the, your REPL, all of them are trying to be editor agnostic and uh, only some of them are actually a way to create a document. So reveal and portal are more of an, an, a REPL extension, but actually OS and literate and note space are all trying to also be a way to create a document. And uh, in a sense, they are similar, but different uh, uh, compared to the experience we saw earlier. Um, yeah, uh, any comments about these? Anyone want to say something about any of these tools? I think most of them really are beautiful examples of building user interfaces, except for node space uh, that, we see it still needs some work. Um, um, any thoughts? I have a question. Yeah, uh, have you have you considered uh, embedding in the document that NodeSpace uh, uh, produces? Have you considered embedding there a full closure script um, runtime? Yeah, so and then yes. then you. You can have, you know, you can have, you, you can have a subset that is completely compatible between the back end and the front end, and the, the presentation layer and the and the development layer. Beautiful. Uh, so you're really anticipating, uh, like, uh, one of these things that we must discuss, and that is uh, Daniel. One of the reasons that I really want to talk with you about it, and that is something that I've been struggling with earlier today and yesterday and the day before yesterday. I still haven't got to make it work uh, because closure script is difficult for me. But yes, uh, what you're saying is that we're creating a document, an HTML page that runs some closure script. And there we can still edit code and have a dynamic experience with the code that can be run by closure script or by some interpreter which is running over closure script and yeah that is very much um, relevant if we want to create tools for teaching like tutorials where people can play with and there are a few of us are very much interested in that um, in general uh, i think what we are trying to do with node space is to make it very much driven by the needs of the different study groups so uh, this group uh, has been uh, pushing it, I think, uh, to some directions. And uh, Sivaram has a lot of ideas about how we could develop it further. And it is happening gradually. And uh, the physics group will be pushing it a lot. And um, yeah, and, and I think um, that is maybe the main kind of uh, principle of node space, to try to be very much driven by the needs today. Um, um, 
Yeah. So now we're moving to a different flavor, and that is those more full notebook-like tools that offer a certain uh, web page user interface, a web application where you actually write your code there and get the visual output and the text editing all happening there. And Gorilla Repel, the famous closure project, which is really, really a uh, kind of uh, came before most of these, uh, it really uh, offered a, a beautiful experience like that, but it stopped uh, developing uh, for a while. Uh, but there is a lot to learn from that project. Um, there are these two projects, uh, Cloud Jupiter and iClosure, which are trying, which are, are uh, enabling a so called closure kernel for Jupiter. Jupiter is a uh, really a famous, well-polished uh, notebook uh, user interface that supports many languages and Clojure is one of them. And these tools allow to do uh, Clojure editing and text editing and data visualization there inside Jupyter. Maria um, is a notebook for Clojure script. It runs with no computational backend just uses the browser for computation and it is a project mainly directed as at teaching i've been using it with a child and it was beautiful to use it for for teaching uh, the language it is uh, has this beautiful minimalistic user interface uh, that is really fun to play with and next journal uh, out of all of these is not open source it is a commercial project that i think a lot of us uh, have been using and will be using uh, both in the SICM utils group and in other contexts. And uh, recently it has brought up this new um, uh, text editing uh, capabilities that bring up a lot of the things we love in the closure editors, like the so-called structure editing, paredit and all that. Uh, they, it brought it uh, in a very full way to the uh, browser and uh, some parts of this are, are open source and we are looking into using them. Um, any comments about these? Mm, great. Um, Saite. Saite is similar to the above. It is a purely um, um, web-based user interface that does have a JVM backend. And I put it in a separate line because it is so unique. It is unlike anything else in the ideas about building a user interface and the, the composability and the recursive structure that it has. And uh, I never grokked it fully, but, but uh, I'm so curious about this project. And it is also, um, uh, it is written by John Anthony, our friend, who is also the author of Hanami that we will look into uh, uh, later this meeting. And um, Saite is, is uh, one of the nice things about it is that it combines uh, writing closure and closure script uh, in, in a very tight connection so that you can write them both and really use Clojure mainly as a computational engine, but mainly do Clojure script in the browser as your way of expression and data visualization. And uh, it has a lot of uh, it, uh, structure of it, uh, sometimes reminds of the flexibility and self-reference nature of Emacs, because really it is built in Clojure script and it is very much extensible and also has the ability to look into its own and add more components to its own. And really, really uh, um, um, such an interesting project. Um, I think some people here know it uh, and maybe you want to say something about it. Um, and another thing that I put in a separate line is Ping Gorilla, which is a continuation of the famous Gorilla REPL uh, in Clojure script and uh, React. And Pig Gorilla is not ready yet, but uh, has been very active in the last year. And 
it is a very ambitious project uh, and has already created lots of small libraries which are part of it and uh, actually some of them are used inside a node space and other tools and uh, one interesting thing about it is that it tries to be both both a web application like all these and a connection to the to any closure uh, editor and repel like these uh, and um, in this sense, it is very ambitious because it is trying to to allow us to to stay in the editor if we wish to, but still create something that is full in its uh, functionality in the sense of something that it looks like a complete uh, notebook application. And another flavor that is is uh, worth mentioning here is uh, Atom Chlorine and VS Code Clover, uh, which are both uh, written by uh, our friend Mauricio, and uh, I think that the common uh, thing about them is first that they uh, are built on the same platform for tooling building, which is called REPL tooling. Um, and second, that they offer some data visualization capabilities inside the editor so that you can have your visual output inside the code you're editing. So it is kind of a different flavor of a data visualization experience. And uh, the reason I'm very much interested in these and, and so happy to, to uh, uh, be in communication with Mauricio is that there is some very general thought in, behind these. And REPL tooling, which is a, a general library for building tooling of these, uh, is really bringing up um, really nice ideas that can be a nice bridge across tools of how a REPL, an editor, and uh, a, a certain browser view can interact and be in communication. And uh, one thing that Mauricio is looking into these days is actually thinking about creating a certain platform for, for uh, uh, extensible definition of data visualizations. And that is something we, uh, that we, we have saw a little bit earlier. When we rendered certain visual elements like a table view or a Vega or Vega light view, we, we actually used something which is part of Pingorilla, which allows to define more uh, to define certain extensions of the hiccup format that contain visual elements. And uh, Mauricio has been thinking a lot about how to, to make a story that where we can create a user-driven library of many kinds of visual elements that will be usable in different tools. And I think that is maybe one of the central questions here, how we could, how we could possibly create something that grows healthily and allows the different tools to enjoy the same language for data visualization. And maybe that could be a topic for discussing later uh, today. Um, so uh, that, that was like a, an attempt to quickly go through the landscape because we cannot not mention all of these. Uh, are there any comments uh, about these? Mm, great. So. I think what we want to do, uh, we have uh, four, 45 more minutes. I think we would like to have like a short look into Vega and Vega Light and Hanami and all that, and then have a discussion. Um, should we have a short break, like five minutes? Maybe it is good to, to have a break. What do you think? So, so let us have a break of five minutes and, and uh, see you soon. Yeah, hello. So we are back to the recording. And what we will do now is to look a little bit into our use of Vega light visualizations through Hanami. And 
Uh, let us share the screen again. Um, yeah. I try to move those zoom controls somewhere. Yeah. Um, great. So uh, here we are back with this data visualization, which is the result of this small piece of code of Hanami. Uh, we have our data. Our data is just a data set of three columns. And uh, you see our data, actually let us look at the data also as, as the raw, in the raw way of looking into it. So it is a list of closure maps, right? And um, that is what we typically do when we want to do Vega Lite visualizations, because Vega Lite works in the JSON format and it expects the JSON uh, equivalent of these uh, data structures. And you see, uh, that is what we are doing here when we are uh, passing the data as a list of closure maps uh, in the creation of this. Uh, a Vega Lite data structure. What is actually created here by this function call, uh, by, by this transformation of Vega Lite? So, Vega Lite is uh, of, of uh, Hanami, Hanami as a template system, which is only part of the Hanami story, but is that is the part that we're using here. Uh, Hanami is a way of creating data structures using pure data transformations. So this Hanami function call actually creates a closure data structure. I will now um, copy this code, but not specify the Vega kind for rendering so that we will have it rendered just as a closure data structure being printed here, you see. So that is a closure data structure that specify a Vega light data visualization when we are passing it actually to be visualized, it is, it is converted to JSON, of course, but we can see in a sense the JSON structure here. And you see that it has more than we actually wrote here. For example, it has the background color, right? This nice background color is already specified and the size of the plot and the fact, the fact that the marks are circles, we didn't write that when we call the function, right? And that is what Hanami does. It injects those reasonable defaults so that we need to specify only what we actually need. You see, for example, it tells that the x-axis of the plot is the x variable in our data. That is a default too. If we had another x variable in our data, we would need to specify it, but we didn't need to because the default is reasonable, right? And um, what we are seeing is that this data structure that is we see here is generated by a certain template, which is the point chart template. So let us look into it. What is the point chart template? So you see, that is the point chart template is another data structure. And it is not so obvious how this was generated from that. And what are all these capital letter names? So the capital letter names are just as a convention of Hanami that I think may be replaced later by another convention. It is just a way to say these things are to be substituted by certain values if those values are specified. So for example, you see that the background that will be part of the generated structure, it will be replaced by some value that may be specified. In this case, it was actually specified. How, when, and who wrote it? So it turns out that there is another data structure of the defaults, and we can look into it.
it is actually a closure atom. So here we see the dereferenced version of this atom, and you see yet another data structure. And the background color is specified in this default data structure, and a lot more things. And the idea of Hanami is to somehow, by a certain very simple set of rules, recursively inject these default values and the user-specified values that we did specify here to inject them and eventually get this data structure. And somehow there is a really nice set of rules that actually removes all the unnecessary parts which are unspecified. And we will not go into the set of rules now, but actually we had another session about it uh, that was recorded and never made publish. But if anybody is interested in that, then I can share it. Um, and so that is a little taste of what Hanami is about. Uh, any questions about this? Yeah, Daniel, what's the relationship between Hanami and Oz? I played a little bit with Oz and it seems to me there are some points of contact. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. So maybe uh, we will come back to, to share the, uh, sorry, um, to share the landscape as we call it. So, Right, we, we mentioned all these tools here. And Oz is one magnificent, really robust and uh, tool for data visualization and literate programming in Clojure that has re really, really a nice uh, user experience. And it is rather centered around Vega and Vega light visualizations, not because they are the only thing that it, it renders, but they were just uh, they just got a lot of attention uh, in building it and in the use usage examples so many people consider oz as a way of rendering vega and vega light while actually it is a more general tool that can do more than vega and vega light so that is what oz is uh, hanami is in a sense one thing that it is, is the library behind Cite, which is yet another magnificent tool, uh, a, a web application uh, tool. Uh, and Hanami is a library for building data visualizations and uh, interactive data visualizations based on Vega and Vega Lite and ClojureScript and React and a few more libraries. Uh, and so both Oz and Hanami and Saite that contains Hanami are full stories that are actually full of many, many aspects of the data visualization story. Uh, but uh, in a minimal use, one may use Oz just for, just for visualizing Vega and Vega light plots. And Hanami too could be used for just visualizing Vega and Vega light plots. So, and historically, they may be the main two stories that grew up in the closure community for these kind of visualizations. Uh, so that is why they have been mentioned one alongside the other. And also they play nicely with each other. So you could use this templating that we just saw, which is Hanabi based, but eventually use Oz as the tool of rendering. And it just works, of course, because it is just data as they say. Uh, does it make sense? Oh, that was excellent. Does it, all the pieces now fit together for me. Thanks so much. Yeah, great. Mm, so I think uh, we now have half an hour. Uh, I think one thing we can do is to look just a little bit into the mechanics example of the double pendulum and see, just see the visual, visualization there and what was involved uh, in making it happen, at least on the visual side, and then maybe have a discussion that could be both technical and bo both like uh, uh, inspirational uh, and more uh, uh, on a wider uh, scope. Um, great. So uh, let us share the screen again. And so.
So I'll go to the double pendulum namespace and let us render it and eventually we will focus on on uh, this plot uh, that has you see it has four uh, components and uh, also uh, it has this this uh, interactive part where actually all oh sorry there is some a layout problem. Oh, so here we are. All components are uh, controlled by the same uh, UI element. Um, and we, we just want to kind of have a taste of, of writing things with Vegalite and Hanami and see how these were generated. Mm, great. So uh, let us look at uh, like a few steps about how these were built. Um, so first, um, here is a, a like a smaller story, similar to what we saw above. Line chart is yet another one of those templates. It allows to create yeah a line chart, and what we needed to to add the only inf only the little information that we needed to add were the data for the line chart, the and the x and y axis. And the data for the line chart was just um, this data. In this case, it is uh, the angle of one of the pendula uh, in our double pendulum animation. Um, yeah, so it is just a simple plot. And you see uh, the fact that we have these uh, 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 tooltips uh, on hover. That is part of what Hanami injects to the bigger story. So right, let us remove the uh, Vega kind for a moment so that we can see it as a data structure. Oh, I have, yeah, sorry. So here is the data structure. And you see, Vega Light specifies uh, for every field, uh, like the x axis, it specifies what variable should be used. In this case, the t, which was the time and the type of it, which can be a quantity, but it can also be something nominal like something that has a few categories, right? So there are these details and you see this tooltip was added automatically by Hanami. And uh, Hanami knew because it's a templating system is recursive, it knew how to inject the proper names of the variables here so that the tooltip tool actually shows the time and the angle in this case. And um, yeah, and you by the way, uh, you see that many things are keywords here and some things are strings. Both would be rendered as strings when we convert it to JSON. So eventually it doesn't matter. The only thing that does matter is that keywords which are part of the templating system that have some, some values injected for them will be replaced by the value that is injected for them as we saw with the background color. But uh, the, this convention of having them in capital letters avoids confusion in a sense. Um, yeah, that, does it make sense so far? Yeah, so, um, so that was some, one example of a plot. Um, now let us go for uh, this one with the, oh, let us re-render it. Uh, sorry, oh, I'll refresh to avoid the, the weight. Um, so, uh, oh, oh, it di uh, didn't re really render yet. Oh, because evaluating the namespace took some time. Okay, so, so maybe let us look into uh, uh, where it is this one with the controls, right? So, um, it is a bit more complicated. And you see, um, to define it, we, oh, where am I? Sorry, I will zoom out a bit. To define it, we needed to define a few layers. And layers are these different things which are uh, 
rendered on the same canvas in a sense. So you see, we have those pivots and the circles and the little circles and all that is rendered as different, a few layers on top of each other. Um, so uh, for example, the rule chart is one of the, that one of the segments and the, this point chart is the one of the little points. And both of them has two colors, which are the two parts of the pendulum, right? How, do, how did we get all that? So uh, I'll try to remove this Vega kind so that we can see the data structure. Let us hope it is not too big because we have more data here, right? Many data points. So I think it will be fine. And in a moment we will see a data structure. And then we can think about what is happening here. So you see, eventually uh, this templating of Hanami resulted in this data structure. And we actually have a few layers, two layers, one for the circles and one for the uh, segments. And in the data, you see every data point actually tells whether it is of P1 or P2. P1 and P2 are the two uh, pendula, right? That will be uh, rendered into colors. And then the um, color for any of the two layers, the color is indeed dependent on the ID, which is either P1 or P2. So we get those uh, blue and orange colors. And um, so that is the data for the circles. You see the data for the circles is just a pair of x, y coordinates and the time and the, the, the pendulum. But why, let us look at the, at the plot for a moment, why uh, one circle is bigger than the others? How does it happen? So that depends on time, right? So uh, if we go back, then um, we see that there is a certain condition. And this condition, uh, don't bother about the details, but what it says is we look into this selected T, this time that is selected by this UI element of the slider. And if the time of the data is very close to it, then this one will get a different opacity uh, of one. Uh, and otherwise it is it will be with a different opacity and also the size of the circle does depend on the time so at this, this very moment where the time is very close to the time selected by the ui slider the size of the circle is much bigger than all other circles and that is why we got uh, this picture where one circle is big and the others are small and you see when we move the time then uh, a different one is selected. Does it make sense? So I think what you just saw explains the parts of the circle, the circles. What about the segments, these uh, pivots of the pendulum? What, what about them? So uh, if we look into the data, then we, uh, 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 sorry, I'm scrolling to get to that part of the data. Oh, right. So we have another transformed way of the same data, data where we actually have two points for each moment in time. And these two points are the two ends of the segment, which is the pivot of, of the, the, the pendulum. And uh, these were generated by a certain transformation from actually the angles, which because the physical simulation actually create, creates the angles of, of the pendula. And we need to kind of transform them by some trigonometry to, into X and Y coordinates, like rectangular coordinates. So that is very briefly like what is going on in this plot. And Actually, I think there is a beautiful promise here that is not news because uh, John Anthony has been doing it for a while with Hanami because creating these Vega light and Vega specifications can be tedious, but actually creating them 
from closure turns out to be fun. And, and I, I'm not sure if there is any other platform that where it is such a joy to create JSON data structures, such as closure with the current set of libraries. And at least that is how I feel. And so that is why to me, Hanami is very exciting every time I look into it. Um, any thoughts about that? Uh, should we look a little bit more into the details? Uh, was it a bit uh, confused maybe? I have a question about one detail. Yeah. Uh, there was a mathematical expression put under test uh, in the, the, the opacity condition was yeah. expressed in, was, was it JavaScript? Yes, it is uh, JavaScript. Yeah, thank you. Right. This thing in the string is JavaScript. And yeah, that is Vega light. And, and we could hope to have a similar story with actual uh, closure script. It may be less um, in harmony because Vega light is actually a beautiful story that has really a lot of thought behind it and also a lot of tradition of this uh, grammar of graphics uh, idea and making it work uh, in harmony with all the little parts of the story is something that does take time so creating a similar system in closed closure script will not be immediate but what we can do is have our uh, closure script uh, reagents and or RAM or OM or other uh, libraries as uh, something that wraps the visualizations and controls them. And uh, I think uh, John Anthony has been uh, writing some really interesting experiments like that, and we should be doing that more. And also trying other data visualization libraries, which are more or less high level than uh, Vegalite. So there is a lot to experiment with, but possibly it will be very uh, rare to have something that uh, feel as coherent as Vegalite. I, I think that is my guess. Yeah. Um, should we go into more detail? Should we look more into it or should we go for a wider discussion? Great. So I think I think it means that we we can leave that, and uh, now we can think. And uh, I, I think uh, there are more, there are many questions to be asked now. I think about about the situation, especially because we have all these uh, different libraries which are all growing, and um, uh, in the SICM utils uh, study group. We are wondering because you know some of us do like to use the editor uh, as we were demonstrating now as as the typical comfortable place to work with but actually some people prefer working in the browser and a few people in the group are very much interested in next journal in writing things that run in closure script and do not need any backends for computation and there is this dilemma of how we could create a group that does both things in harmony. And I think one of the interesting directions is what Daniel said earlier. What Daniel said earlier was that we could use our editor and REPL to create visual stories in a web page, but that web page could still have some code that is dynamic and can be edited further and run on the browser in closure script and um, and that is something that I think we should try more and uh, we are going to try in the coming days and weeks um, and another question is is I think what Mauricio is looking into and that is the creation of this this maybe a common layer that could be used by different tools and the reason it is important is that we want our collection of visual libraries to be growing in a community driven way where people will be able to add their own visualization libraries and just be able to use them in all the different tools. So that is a community challenge, like a challenge of standardization. 
And I think it matters a lot. And I think we can also learn from the story of other, other ecosystems uh, where it did work this way, that at some point they did reach this standardization across tools and libraries. So yeah, for me, these, these are some of the interesting questions and I'm wondering what you think. So then I have, I have some thoughts. So way back when I started using IPython and um, I came from a Lisp background. Uh, and so I was used to a really rich REPL. And when I started using Python, the Python standard REPL was very limiting. Um, IPython was a way better REPL for Python. Uh, so I used that and had a bunch of magic words and you could interact with your environment. Um, so you could do a listing of your current directory and, and many more things. Um, then the Jupyter notebooks um, um, came out. And so the idea there was to be able to display richer information besides the very, you know, simple tables you could do on IPython and to avoid having um, Windows pop on your desktop with JTK or some other rendering engine showing graphs, right? So, so I think that what Daniel said really resonates with me because I think the richness of the REPL is what makes um, Faro in particular really powerful. Uh, to the extent that we can combine the work that you are doing with something like Reveal or Rebel, where you can ins inspect values dynamically and um, sort of go sideways exploring data, I think that's a, a really rich path, has a lot of potential. So I think that's that's one area of promise that, that I see. Um, the second piece is I've seen some interesting work being done by Brian Bostock of D3 fame on a project called Observables HQ. I assume that people here are familiar with that work. Um, so take a look at it because I think that, um, I think the visualization path that he's pursuing is sort of similar to Vega, um, but it feels a little different in particular, the use of shaders. Um, so that's, yeah, that's exactly, that's exactly the web page. Um, I think another, another example to look at is Mathematica or Wolfram notebooks as they're known now, right? Uh, and the thing with uh, Wolfram notebooks is that it has a completely vertically integrated environment. So you can do front-end development in Wolfram language. You can do um, Hadoop computations in the same environment. You, 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 you also have a bunch of information, a bunch of facts available to you. Um, if anyone has uh, a curiosity, I just would look at, at the Wolfram side. The Wolfram Alpha side attempts to have a knowledge and a computational environment blended into one. So, so I mean, I think that the takeaway from that example is the integration of graphics, computation, and text, which I think is particularly rich. Um, but I think that what this group is doing, which I find really valuable, is the emphasis on the editor. I think for me, uh, Emacs is like a little mini world. I don't go as far as other people that do everything on Emacs. I have, I don't use the mail client. I don't read my news on Emacs, but I do lots of other things on Emacs. Uh, I see the same path being followed by Visual Studio Code where people adding, are adding plugins and trying to sort of live in that ecosystem. So I think to the extent that we can combine the editor, the REPL and the rich visualizations that you guys have talked about. I mean, I think that's really the path. Uh, you know, I, you know, what I, I don't know if that makes any sense. You know, I'm sort of like speaking all out of the top of my head. Yeah, thank you so much for this. Yeah, by the way, uh, in our physics group, a few of the people have come with some experience with uh, Mathematica. 
and uh, it it is interesting to hear those experiences for people who are now doing similar things in closure, but also in terms of the symbolic uh, reasoning, which is just another aspect of it that now ha is getting a really magnificent story in closure. Mm. Any other thoughts? So Daniel, um, I work with graph data quite a lot. And one of the things I was, I was actually looking in the background was if Hanami had any uh, template, pre-built template for directed acyclic graphs and doesn't seem to be, right? It has a tree, uh, template for tree st data structure, but uh, not for uh, DAG. Um, so I wonder how easy or how it would be to, to be able to create a template for Hanami for something like that, be able to create your own user templates. Or... Yeah, great. And yeah, so somehow uh, this uh, topic of visualizing networks, it comes, comes up almost every time we discuss data visualizations mm. because right, it is so important. And, and so I think there are two questions here. Uh, one is about the support of Vega and Vega Light for visualizing graphs, as in networks, right? And the other is whether it is easy to write a template that will make it fun to create from closure. And I think for the, the second question, I, the answer is almost always yes. It is a joy to write things with Hanami and to create more templates. It is built to be extensible and it is just data and it is really, really fun. Uh, about the support of Vega, Vega Light for graphs, there is some support, but I'm not sure how performant it is. Mm -hmm. I just haven't tried it enough uh, compared to D3 and other options. So we should try right? and, and let us try, let us, as always, the answer should be, let us have a session where we are trying only that for two hours. Yeah, that would be nice to do. I've had to drop into drop down into D3 for any of that kind of work. And it becomes a little bit uh, uh, of a pain to work at that level. So if, if we can get, uh, you know, some uh, template-based system via Hanami, it looks sort of like a really sweet spot to hit. Yeah. By the way, Sivaram, when you write D3, do you write it from Clojure script? Yeah, I try to use Clojure for D3. Yeah, using one of the existing wrappers, because there are a few which looks interesting. And uh, there is this one called Ride. Uh, I will share it for, the, for a moment. Uh, I think this one, uh, this uh, reagent wrapper for D3 looks nice in, in at least in the, the, the API that it offers. And I think that is one of the things we will be experimenting this in the coming days because we feel that we need D3 for some of the mechanics uh, simulations. Um, or maybe you did it some other way, more, more uh, direct. Um, yeah, I, I, I did it slightly differently, I think. Uh, I did look at this, hmm. but it didn't, I don't think it worked for me at that time, or uh, I can't remember now. Uh, so yeah, it was definitely, uh, I'm trying to see if I have that. Uh, I have a question. So, um, Hanami is um, made by the same person that writes Saite, right? Yeah. Uh, John Anthony? Yes. Is that the name? Right. So, uh, I am curious um, 
it seems to me like from the from the again I'm I'm a complete outsider uh, both to the conversation and and to to the the efforts that you have been doing uh, all this time in this nice little group that you have, uh, but I wonder it seems there is an, a lot of overlap between what you're building on top of Hanami and what John Anthony already has built on top of Hanami, namely Saite. So I, I wonder what, where is the where is the waste here? Where is the wasted efforts? Uh, have you been? Uh, it it seems to me that you have to to uh, to look into 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 some kind of a, I first understand what Saite is and whether or not it satisfies your whether or not it aligns with your goals and also maybe if you can collaborate with uh, John Anthony directly or build you know merge together or something like that that's my question basically yeah great great so so I think um, one thing that we are and will be collaborating on is actually building a good collection of templates uh, built by Hanami for more and more uh, user cases. And another thing that we should collaborate, and that is like a general comment, I think, about all the authors of tools, I think we should somehow collaborate on creating a common language for specifying visualizations, which are not just Vega and Vega-like, but much more than that. And I think that is crucial, uh, this kind of collaboration. And then there is the question of the tools themselves. And uh, Saite, yeah, it is really fascinating. But uh, I think uh, our set of assumptions where we are trying to build something really much less magnificent and much smaller and much, much uh, um, less sophisticated is that we need something that will allow different closure practitioners to use their own environment, which is typically an editor and a repl. And we need something that will work in different environments without a kind of choosing for the user the editing experience. And maybe this assumption is, is wrong or not important enough, but it is certainly the assumption that has been driving us in evolving this uh, small set of tooling that is called NodeSpace. And we are seeing it in our everyday practice because a few of us are Emacs users, a few are using uh, Cursive, others are using VS Code, and we are actually collaborating on the same documents. And you, you mean you can't do that with Saite? Yeah, Saite, Saite is very opinionated about how the user interface looks because it is a, a web-based editor, or it is much more than that. It is a web application that offers a, like a, really an amazing environment for editing and visualizing and creating structured documents but it is very much opinionated about how the interface looks and about, about what editor to use, which is a certain flavor of code mirror with the uh, structural editing and Emacs like key bindings. So we couldn't ask everybody to use it, I think. But, but the, the, the... You could easily decide that what you want to do, if Saite is uh, giving the satisfying answer to what you need to do, then you can easily decide that your effort will be to, to uh, put support for other editors that are already supported, because Saite already supports Vim and Emacs and stuff like that. So you can you can decide, okay, we're going to do uh, editor support for, for VS Code or whatever the needs are. Uh, it, it supports... Uh... Uh, the sets of key bindings of of Emacs and possibly Vim uh, culture in the browser, but you know when we are talking about the closure editor, we are talking about more than the key bindings for editing. We are talking when we are talking about Emacs, we are talking about Saito, yeah. and 
So I'm confused because the the readme says in um, the readme of site it says interactive documents with editor support, and then in in parentheses Emacs, Vim, Sublime, and Paradigm. Yeah, that means the key bindings in the sense of site. And yes, it it does have this way of defining your own key bindings. And yeah, John Anthony really built paradigm like key bindings in the browser uh, before the current uh, new version of Code Miro uh, su supported it. And and uh, yes, there is a lot of things. Right. So it's not really editor support in the sense that you are in your editor. It's like right. you are in the browser and you have key bindings that are Emacs like or Vim like. Exactly. Exactly. Ah, okay. That, that yeah. confused and, me. And, and it does so amazingly. Yeah, I haven't seen a system that brings such a, a complete story to what one can do in the browser, like Cite. But it does ask you to be there and not to be in your Emacs and Cite. So you, you, you deem that, okay, so you, you, everybody here is, is, is of the opinion that you don't want to leave your, your editor? Or is, that, is that the Not everybody. Thing? Uh, okay. It's more complicated than that. <laughs> and I guess people can say, but yeah, there are also people in the study groups who do like the browser. I, I mean, wasn't very curious, Daniel, yeah. I'm very curious about having a richer repo, you know, that Reveal and Rebel both promise a lot of capabilities. And I'm not sure that Cite would support that. You know, if Cite supports an arbitrary repo, you know, I might be willing to... Uh, just live with my key bindings and par edit. And that's really the minimal requirement for me. But if, if but if richer REPLs aren't supported or there's no path for doing that, then I think that what this group is doing is very interesting. You know, who knows? It might not go anywhere, but I think the idea is definitely worth looking at. Well, you're a nice group, so I, I wish you all the best of luck. <laughs> It's, it's, it's a challenge, it's a challenge. So uh, it's so difficult to satisfy everybody all the time. Uh, we will stop for a moment because it is the end of the official time. So if anybody needs to leave, then maybe it is a good moment to recap and uh, say some concluding words. And then if you wish, we can continue after whoever needs to leave uh, can leave. Um, so, uh, yeah, so thank you. Then I have to go, but thank you very much for everything today. I really appreciate the, this group and it's fantastic. I've learned a lot today. Yeah, thank you for today, Andres. Um, Thanks so much. Thank you. Nice group. Thank you. Yep, same here. I got to go. Uh, really great session. I, I loved uh, the walk through all the tools. So looking forward to more. See you soon, Mark. Thank you so much. Take care. Yeah, uh, should we continue a little bit? You're still recording. <laughs> right, yeah. Uh, uh, is it a good time to stop the recording or do we, we like to... Yeah, so maybe it is a good time to say goodbye to the recording. Uh, so one last comment is that uh, Note Space is looking for uh, collaborators. And because really it has been written by someone who doesn't know how to do UI engineering, which is me and um, with the kind help of many friends around. But still, uh, I think if anybody wants to be part of building uh, this piece of tooling, uh, then any help will be very much welcome. Um, and also there is, uh, there are some new efforts to build a certain set of Hanami templates for different needs of visualization, not only on top of Vega and Vega Lite. And if anybody is interested in joining this effort, then it would be wonderful. And uh, now we'll say goodbye to the recording and see you on our next meetings. And goodbye. <laughs>